Go ahead and have a seat. I want to remind you that if there's something we can be praying for you about, you can drop us a note, an, an email note, to prayers, plural, at westwoodchurch.net, and we count it an honor to pray for you about whatever it is that may be going on. That um, note will go to the staff, um, and then if you would like that to go to our prayer chain, it will go there too, but not unless you tell us. So we just uh, would count it an honor if there's something we can be praying for you about that you'd let us know. So a bit of a confession. Um, I've had to reckon with the reality lately that I am at least on the threshold of approaching old. I don't know what old means for you. I'm in my 40th year. That means I'll turn 40 this fall. I know some of you laugh. You're like, you're just a young pup. You're a kid yet. Others of you, I know you're like, dude, we've been meaning to tell you the gray is showing. And I know that, and I'd ask you to keep those comments to yourself. The mirror shows me plenty, I promise you. But regardless of your definition, numbers of gray hairs, numbers of years pass on the calendar. Here's how I know I'm getting there. I'm beginning to have to describe to my kids things that, I mean, they just have no frame of reference for. So I think I've told my kids a little bit about this phenomenon called a land phone. Now, if I haven't yet told them in detail, the day will come I'll have to describe this thing to a digital native. That there used to be, boys and girls, in the days of our fathers, these phones, there was a receiver that you had to take and stand in one place. It was connected by a cord to a base unit on a wall connected to the wall that didn't go anywhere. So you wanted to make a call, not a tweet, not a snap, not a whatever Instagram does, I stay away. But whatever that is, like you, you had to make a call. And then if you were making a call and someone else wanted to make a call, they'd come and pester you or they'd just stand there and eavesdrop till you gave up. Or likewise, if you were waiting to make the call, you'd do that to somebody else till they gave up. It's the craziest thing. It occurs to me, how on earth could a digital native possibly get their mind around something like that? It's archaic now. I mean, of course, technology moves fast, so that's part of why. But it, really, it almost just kind of seems quaint. Like, it'd be a nice relic to go see in a museum, but imagining a world where that were true is really kind of hard, right? It occurs to me that as we talk about the kingship of Jesus, something similar is at work because... Kings, monarchies are kind of a relic of the past. They seem kind of archaic, quaint, and disconnected from life here and now. Now, I recognize that Great Britain apparently has a monarchy, but as far as I can tell, that's mostly a figurehead thing made for tabloids and daytime TV. I could be wrong, and to any of our friends from across the pond who may be joining us, I mean no offense. I'm probably speaking from ignorance. That's just the way it sort of seems. Even so, that's about the only monarchy I really know about. Again, talking about kings seems like... like that's outdated. That's this old mode. What could that possibly have to do with life here and now? Well, it turns out everything when rightly understood. So before we get any further, a few general things about the way that kings operate. <clears throat> kings make decisions. They can cast edicts that, enforce, that create and then enforce the law. They rule. They can provide protection. At their best, they're supposed to have the best interests of their subjects at heart. But at worst, they can command who's going to go serve in the military, where they're going to go serve, what battles they're going to fight. Regardless of all the particulars, they rule with absolute authoritarian power. Kings were not chosen by popular vote. They were appointed whether the people wanted them to be or not. Kings did not show weakness or make themselves subject to others willingly. They showed strength and might and control, which is all part of why this scene that we're going to read in just a moment, where Jesus' kingship is affirmed, is at once so startling and also so compelling and so world-changing, earth-shattering. That scene is found in John chapter 18. It starts there anyway. On page 826 in the Bibles under your chairs, if you'd like to look them up, you can. We'll have the words on the screen as well. We'll be reading from the New Living Translation. Starts on page 826. I want to just set the scene here. So Jesus is on trial before the Roman governor, Pilate. But he has been sent there, not by the Romans, but by his own people, the Jewish leaders. In fact, the high priest Caiaphas was where he was um, under trial the night before, or the early morning. And that had all been as the result of an escalating conflict between Jesus and the religious leaders of the day. The problem was, they wanted to get rid of him, and the more that they tried to cast him off and speak badly of him, the larger the crowds grew, the more his influence grew, the more they felt threatened, and so they knew they had to get rid of him by killing him, but they couldn't. The Romans could. So they found a way to bring him before Pilate on the charge of being a king. That's where we'll pick it up. Would you stand, please? 
as I start in John 18, verse 28, and read through verse 5 of the next chapter. Jesus' trial before Caiaphas ended in the early hours of the morning. Then he was taken to the headquarters of the Roman governor. His accusers didn't go inside because it would defile them and they wouldn't be allowed to celebrate the Passover. So Pilate, the governor, went out to them and asked, What is your charge against this man? We wouldn't have handed him over to you if he weren't a criminal, they retorted. Then take him away and judge him by your own law, Pilate told them. Only the Romans are permitted to execute someone, the Jewish leaders replied. This fulfilled Jesus' prediction about the way he would die. Then Pilate went back into his headquarters and called for Jesus to be brought to him. Are you the king of the Jews? He asked him. Jesus replied, Is this your own question? Or did others tell you about me? Am I a Jew? Pilate retorted. Your own people and their leading priests brought you to me for trial. Why? What have you done? Jesus answered, My kingdom is not an earthly kingdom. If it were, my followers would fight to keep me from being handed over to the Jewish leaders. But my kingdom is not of this world. Pilate said, So you are a king. Jesus responded, You say, I am a king. Actually, I was born and came into the world to testify to the truth. All who love the truth recognize that what I say is true. What is truth? Pilate asked. And then he went out again to the people and told them, He is not guilty of any crime. But you have a custom of asking me to release one prisoner each year at Passover. Would you like me to release this king of the Jews? But they shouted back, No, not this man. We want Barabbas. Barabbas was a revolutionary. Then Pilate had Jesus flogged with a lead-tipped whip. The soldiers wove a crown of thorns and put it on his head, and they put a purple robe on him. Hail, king of the Jews, they mocked as they slapped him across the face. Pilate went outside again and said to the people, I am going to bring him out to you now, but understand clearly that I find him not guilty. Then Jesus came out wearing the crown of thorns and the purple robe, and Pilate said, Look, here is the man. We'll stop our reading there. My friends, this is God's word to us today. Thanks be to God. God, thank you for your word. As always, may you teach us and transform us through it by the power of your spirit in whatever way you see fit. May that be so. Amen. Go ahead and have a seat. So before we come back to this passage specifically, I want to talk for a moment about kings in Israel. Israel, the name of God's people as recorded in the story of the Old Testament. There were lots of similarities to be, between the way that they, their kings operated and the way that kings operated in the world around them, but there were also a couple of very important differences. The first among them, the most important, is this. God's people have always believed that God himself is king over all the universe, with Israel being God's special possession. So he was king to them in a unique way, but God was the creator of heaven and earth. He was the supreme sovereign over the entire universe. This is reflected in the scriptures all over the place. Matter of fact, as I was considering grabbing one or two to show you, I was like, where do I start? It's everywhere. And the places it isn't explicitly said, it's assumed as a given that God is supremely king over all creation. Now, the earthly kings of Israel, they came into being later. And it's important to know that they were not God's plan A. They were a concession. They were a, a compromise of sorts, and they came with warnings. The way it went was, from the earliest beginning of the Bible in Genesis, there are kings in neighboring countries, but Israel didn't have a king. They had other earthly figures who would provide leadership in this way or that, but they didn't have a king. As the story unfolded, after they had entered the promised land, eventually time goes on to the point where the people begin to say, we want a king like our neighbors around us. A king who can be here, who can lead us, who can lead us into battle. And so they ask God through the prophet Samuel for an earthly king. And so the prophet Samuel goes to God and then explains the request. And it's interesting that God replies to Samuel, because Samuel was filling something of a leadership role at the time. God says to Samuel, you need to know this. They're not rejecting you. They are rejecting me, actually, as their rightful king. And give them these warnings, and I'll paraphrase. Essentially, he warns them that if they choose an earthly king, this king will turn like the rest of kings, self-serving. This king will use you instead of serve you. He will brutally oppress you and tax you heavily. He'll take your sons to do with what he wishes as his servants, soldiers in his army to fight his battles. He'll take your daughters to make them servants in whatever way he sees fit. 
Again, he'll rule over you oppressively. He'll live lavishly on your backs and he'll serve his officials who serve him. He will use you instead of serve you. And to that, the people said, give us a king. So God gave them a king. It's important to recognize that even when he did so, God was still the true king. God's rule was supposed to be made visible through these earthly kings. But that first fundamental reality was never to change. Now, God gave them these earthly kings. First, he anointed through the prophet Samuel, the king Saul. Then there was David. Then there was Solomon. Then there's this split, divided kingdom, Rehoboam and Jeroboam. There is then, from then on, throughout the story of the Old Testament kings, a northern kingdom of Israel, a southern kingdom of Judah, a long line of kings in both, mostly bad, kind of downward spiral here and there. A few bright spots, notable, important bright spots, but mostly it was a downward spiral because that's important to recognize God's prediction, his warning, was absolutely right and true. Eventually, there is no king. Because what happens is, the people persist in their rebellion and their sinfulness for so long that God allows foreign powers to conquer them and take them out of the land he had promised and then given them. And so for a time, there literally is no king in Israel or Judah, which makes one promise especially important and interesting. Of the earthly kings, there were these three of the united monarchy, Saul, David, and Solomon. According to the Bible, David is clearly the favorite among these earthly kings, despite the many messes he made, and he for sure did if you know his story. Enduringly, he was still known as a man after God's own heart. And so in 2 Samuel 7, God gives to David this promise that one of his descendants will be on the throne of Israel forever, that he will establish his kingdom with justice and righteousness and his kingdom will have no end. That promise was echoed even by the prophets during this time when there was no king because the people had been conquered. And from the very first sentence of the New Testament, the writers pick up on this promise and say, it is now come. Matthew, first book of the New Testament, chapter 1, verse 1, first sentence. This is the genealogy of the Messiah Jesus, son of David, son of Abraham. Pointing to the fact that Jesus was there to fulfill all God had promised, all the way back to Abraham, when God promised to give his covenant people a blessing that they would then in turn bless the world. That one particular descendant would be a blessing to the whole world. Of the promise to the King David, to King David, that one of his descendants would be on the throne forever. All of that, the New Testament writers say, from the first sentence and throughout, Jesus has fulfilled. And it's precisely at this point that the two identities of Israel's king are folded into one in Jesus. Because each of the Gospels makes this connection to the future promised king in the line of David, and each in its own way makes it clear that Jesus is God's own kingly presence returning to his people. This king in the line of David and God as king come together as one in Jesus, which is why it was so surprising, confusing, and deeply true when Jesus said what he did in this passage, that my kingdom is not of this world. Now, the passage that we read is from the New Living Translation. Every translation has to make interpretive kind of decisions. In this one, at the beginning of this section, it says, my kingdom is not an earthly kingdom. But that's a bit misleading because that's not what the original text says. It says, my kingdom is not of this world. And then that phrase is repeated a little bit lower in what we read. And that gives you some insight into why people make these decisions when they're translating. They think people are going to get bored if we just give the repetition that's in the text because we do. We get bored easy, right? So they make changes to make it a little bit more readable, but that's not what the original says. It says, my kingdom is not of this world, and that phrase is repeated. And it's important that at the outset that we don't make a, a mistake in understanding what that means. We have to re resist this dualistic thinking. There's physical and spiritual, and it was always meant to be divided, that the physical is bad and wasting away. The spiritual is good and should be pursued only and left, and because that's what's going to be left to endure. Faith is a matter of personal, private preference, having no bearing on public, cosmic realities. But that is not the division that the Bible imagines. Instead, the point Jesus is clearly making is that if his kingdom was of this world, his followers would revolt violently. In fact, that's exactly what Peter tried to do in a couple of stories just before this in the garden. They come to arrest Jesus. He grabs a sword. He cuts off the ear of one of the soldiers. Jesus rebukes him, heals the ear, and Peter has no idea what to do with that. 
kind of king. And so he flees like the rest. So the point Jesus is making is that if his kingdom was of this world, his followers would violently revolt. But his kingdom not being of this world is not the same as meaning it is not for this world. Because it absolutely is. Remember, God is understood to be the king of all things, the creator of heaven and earth. The kingdom of God, the reign, the rule of God breaking into this world is the central theme of the gospels. It's what Jesus says is happening now that he's there to bring it. It's what the rest of the Bible says has come and is coming in full someday. That God's life, God's kingdom is coming to this earth. So Jesus speaking and acting the way he does before Pilate doesn't mean his kingdom isn't for here and now, but what it means is that the way the kingdom of God comes must be in line with the kind of king Jesus is. Thus, this story of him laying down his life. He's before a Roman governor who would have no power over him if it were not given to him, and yet he surrenders his life in sacrificial love. He is enthroned as king as he's lifted on a cross. He's given a crown of thorns pressed into his head as the blood drips down his brow. That's the reason for the other ways Jesus reverses expectations throughout the gospel stories and that the message of the, of the gospel turned upside down its original world despite all odds. And it's summarized so well in Philippians 2 when the writer Paul said to a group of Christians who were endlessly bickering with one another, and he said, your attitude must be the same as Christ Jesus, who being in very nature God, didn't consider equality with God as something to cling to. Instead, he laid down his divine privileges. He humbled himself and became a human, humbled himself and became a servant, humbled himself to the point of death, even death on a cross. And on that it hinges. Therefore, he was exalted to the highest place at God's right hand, and that at the name of Jesus, every tongue will confess Jesus as Lord, every knee will bow and acknowledge he is Lord. The good news, the gospel is such good news because of the kind of king God is revealed to be through Jesus. Now, I don't know if you're a fan of Lord of the Rings, but if you're not, I think it's probably time, isn't it? I mean, after all, there was like 10 years when I don't think a single sermon or youth talk was given without alluding to Lord of the Rings. If you're familiar with the movies, then you'll remember this scene I described taken from the third movie, aptly named The Return of the King. There's a scene near the end where the rightful king, Aragorn, is coronated as king. And there's this beautiful ceremony, and the whole thing is gripping. I may or may not have shed a tear watching that. Because of the kind of king Aragorn has already been revealed to be. If you've followed the saga, you know that he is both full of love and courage. He serves, he puts himself at risk, instead of asking others to assume the risk. He is loyal, fiercely loyal and brave and courageous, the first in battle, not willing to take his place as rightful king until the victory has been won and secured. And that's especially in stark contrast to the one who had been the steward of the throne of Gondor beforehand. And when he's coronated as king, the first thing he does is acknowledge everyone who's helped make this day become a reality, including the faithful hobbits who have been there from the beginning. It's a beautiful scene because of the kind of king Aragorn is. And so it is for us. The good news announcement is that King Jesus brings the kingdom of God to earth in infinite love because it is a kingdom of infinite love. It's amazing how this kingdom is announced as this cosmic announcement of a reality that Jesus is king. Sin has been paid for and dealt with. Death has been defeated. Now in part, someday in full. Jesus will come again to set all things right. Big claims that come as a personal invitation. Every individual has the opportunity to take their kingdom and surrender it to his or not. And so what I would like to do is just talk about three everyday implications of that announcement that comes to us as an invitation. First is this. If Jesus is king, make no mistake about it, we owe our allegiance to the king. He is the rightful king of all. And we do well to remember and acknowledge that reality, though we may be tempted often by the bent of our own heart or by the many messages coming towards us that we are sovereign, that we are supreme. My friends, that is not true. We are created mortal beings who will give an account of our lives to the king. 
It is not the case that we are the ultimate authority that everyone needs to give an account to or that we are only accountable to. We do well to remember that fact, that reality. But the beautiful, mysterious, compelling reality that comes with it is that our allegiance to the king is for our good because of the kind of king Jesus is. And what goes with that is none are forced to receive the goodness of the king. The medium is the message is the way the phrase goes. Again, the way that the good news, the announcement and reality of the kingdom breaks into our world must be in line with the kind of king Jesus is. And so no one is forced to receive it. Now, make no mistake about it. There are real and lasting consequences to rejecting the rightful kingship of Jesus in this life and in the next life. I believe the Bible makes it clear that those who persist in their rejection of God as the rightful king of their lives will be lost forever if they persist in that rejection. And that is an absolute tragedy whenever that happens. Whenever one created and loved by God, who is made to co-create, co-labor, to be known by the God who created them, chooses to reject all that, it's always a tragedy. But it is a real possibility. That only is further evidence to the point that none are forced to receive God's kingdom. But flipping that over, more positively, living lives of loving obedience to King Jesus, we can know is for our good. Who else could have possibly demonstrated his trustworthiness more than Jesus, the one who loved us and gave his life for us? So we can know that his commandments, his instructions are good and life-giving and for our good. That leads me to the next point. If Jesus is king, then power and strength are turned upside down according to the usual way of the world. If Jesus is king, then that means humility is strength. Serving is the way to use power. See, sometimes brute force and imposing of a heavy-handed will, regardless of the context, are perhaps indeed a way of keeping evil in check. Or maybe bringing order into an intense and dangerous situation of chaos. But it will not change the world for good. Make no mistake about it. Such display, displays of force and power, brute force, imposing a heavy-handed will, may keep evil in check, but they will never defeat evil because only God's kind of love can do that. As King Jesus showed us firsthand. So some questions for us to wrestle with. First of all, how do we use the power and the strength and the influence that we are given? How do we steward those things? Do we just serve ourselves? Do we primarily serve ourselves? Or in love, do we serve the king and serve others? Even in our pursuit of high and noble goals, the pursuit of truth, the pursuit of justice to defeat evil in the world, are we tempted to forsake the weapons of the king, that is God's kind of love, and do we instead use the weapons of the world? that are opposed to all of what King Jesus stands for and came to bring to our world. So how do we use our power, our strength, our influence? How do we call those to account whom we appoint as leaders similarly? Because the reality is, it is only the power of God's kind of love that can defeat evil in the world. Which brings me to the last point, which is this. Love really is the most powerful force in the universe. Consider it this way. If the rightful king of all, God Almighty, was going to step into the world and act with finality to defeat sin and evil, and he was going to make things right, you would think he would do that by bringing his best stuff to the game to get the job done, wouldn't you? I think sometimes we forget he did. That is what he did. And it was characterized by love. The one word that characterizes Jesus, his kingdom, and according to his wishes, the one word that will most characterize his followers is love. Love gets displayed in all kinds of ways. Humility and hospitality, courage and sacrifice, truth and faithfulness, and all the other ways the New Testament describes it from there. But the source and animating spirit of all of it is love. So if you're wondering, as you look around the world, sometimes maybe you feel hopeless, like I sometimes do. If you're wondering, what could possibly have the power to change the world, even still today, this is the answer. King Jesus is kind of love. 
That fact has not changed in 2,000 years. I want to invite the band forward again as I close here. You know, beyond the everyday sorts of implications that we've touched on, and I promise there were many others we could have, lots that I left out, one of the great comforts that God is king and that Jesus is what God the king is truly like is this. No matter what we're facing, we can rest assured that no matter what, the God who is supremely sovereign has also come near. That the God who sometimes, for whatever reasons that we may never fully understand, allows painful events into our lives, into the lives of those around us, he has also entered into the same kind of pain. He has the power as the king to do what is right and best, and he will. But also, it is good to remember that he has suffered the worst of the worst. And yet, the first followers of the king made the audacious claim that death was the place where a whole new creation began to break into our world. That it was through death that resurrection came, guaranteeing for each of us who call on the name of Jesus the same healing and hope of the resurrection that broke into the world on the third day after the crucifixion will be ours as well. It, it comes to us now by the power of the Spirit in part, but it will come someday in full in God's good timing. So in the meantime, we can trust that his rightful reign over all creation is real and true. It has come and it is yet coming and it is good. And from there, we can have the courage to continue to live in fierce love, even for our enemies if we take Jesus seriously. Doing all of that as an act on the one hand of defiance in the face of the kingdoms of this world that show themselves in evil and hate violence and enmity and division, we know that quite well. We can also do that as an act of faith and trust and love for this world's good and true King, King Jesus, who may well be a king not of this world, thanks be to God, but is nonetheless a king for this world. Would you stand please as we sing together and proclaim and celebrate that reality?